Um, so, uh, bottom of page 39, the origin, the origin of the idea of punishment um, is not in a metaphysical doctrine of free will that an individual could have done otherwise and is therefore responsible. Instead, it's in the it's in the reactive anger at being harmed or injured. Um, at the very bottom of 39, he says that, um, that this reactive anger is held within bounds, however, and modified through the idea that every injury has its equivalent in something. So, um, when we are harmed, when we are injured, our natural reaction to that is a kind of uh, resentment. Um, and this is something that gets channeled into the idea that that harm can be paid off. That harm can be uh, given an equivalent. Um, so, the origin of the idea of punishment here was not in the idea that someone else has done something that they could have done otherwise. It's not in the metaphysics of the free will, but simply in the reactive emotions of being harmed getting channeled into the idea that there's an equivalent that can be paid. So someone who harms you has uh, put himself under a debt that can be repaid by something else. I broke off that sentence here. Through the idea that every injury has an equivalent in something that can really be paid off, even if only through the pain of its agent. Um, okay, so uh, this is the model for the origin of this idea of, of punishment in the model of a, a kind of contract, a buyer and seller who puts himself under a debt to someone else that then is to be paid off. Um, and so notice that this idea, this idea of a kind of contract, this idea of a debt that's to be paid off, doesn't have anything to do with ideas of free will or whether somebody could have done something differently. It's just a simple matter of fact. You might say it's just the external fact of the matter that someone put themselves under a debt and now it's to be paid off. So the, 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 the metaphysics of free will, what internally went on in order to put themselves under that debt is irrelevant. Um, the, the, the only fact is, the only relevant fact is, whether there's a debt, whether it was paid off, and if not, what exchange would make it right? Okay, um, section five. Um, so we're still talking about the early stage of development of this idea before they are moralized. Um, and so there needs to be some way of, he thinks, impressing this idea of responsibility and commitment, this idea of paying off one's debts. Well, what we're talking about here is kind of a model of contract, kind of model of exchange, one person doing something for another, putting the other person under debt that's to be paid off. So this kind of contract, this kind of model of mutual commitment and exchange, really is what we've been talking about with the idea of promise. And so Nietzsche here again is pointing to the methods of enforcement of a contract methods of enforcement of balancing debts that are extremely harsh. He says that we can expect the methods of enforcement to be hard, cruel, 
and embarrassing the enforcement of these kind of pre-moral contracts are going to be hard, cruel, and embarrassing. Um, in order, he said, right, uh, just at line 15. In order to instill trust in his promise of repayment, to provide a guarantee for the seriousness and the sacredness of his promise, to impress repayment on his conscience as a duty, as an obligation, the debtor, by virtue of a contract, pledges to the creditor, in the case of non-payment, something else that he possesses. So he violates his debt, he has to pay something else, over which he still has power. For example, his body, or his wife, or his freedom, or even his life. Um, further down, 25. Above all, however, the creditor could subject the body of the debtor to all manner of ignominy and torture. For example, cutting as much from it, from the debtor's body, as appears commensurate to the magnitude of, of the debt. This is like literally the idea of a pound of flesh, right? In, inflicting harm and pain on the debtor as an equivalent for the debt that has not been balanced. Okay, well, so this raises an obvious question. Um, how is that in any way equivalent? Right, so if, uh, if I am a debt to you that goes unpaid, and you inflict pain on me, how does that balance anything? How does that pay off the debt in any way. Well, the answer, he says, is in the pleasure that the person inflicting the pain gets from extracting it. Uh, the very top of 41. He says, the equivalence consists in this, that in place of an advantage that directly makes good for the injury, Hence, in place of a compensation in money or land or possession, for example, which is what paying the debt actually would be, the creditor is granted a certain feeling of satisfaction as repayment and compensation. The feeling of satisfaction that comes from being permitted to vent his power without a second thought on one who is powerless. So the enjoyment of doing violence is what makes up for the, the loss. Um, so section six, it's here, he says, uh, in this kind of repayment through inflicting harm, physical harm, physical torture, that we are going to find the origin of the idea of guilt. Uh, notice, we don't have it yet. This is still a pre-moral kind of understanding of equivalence. So far, we only have the idea that debts should be repaid, which is for each a pre-moral idea, and um, one way that it gets paid is by inflicting harm on someone else. Um, okay. Um, this is, is the, so look at the very end of section six on page 42. It says, seeing suffer feels good, making suffer even more so. This, he says, is a hard proposition, but a central one. An old, powerful, human, all too human proposition, to which, by the way, even the apes might subscribe. Okay, so this is a human, the fact that people enjoy first observing, but especially inflicting pain on others, venting their power over others without a second thought. This is, he says, a human, all too human truth. This is a brutal fact about human psychology. 
Nietzsche, I want to emphasize to you, is not praising this fact. He's just pointing it out. Other people, maybe you, have been reluctant to notice this fact, reluctant to look honestly at what human beings are actually like. But this is what they're actually like. Uh, and given this human nature, he thinks, it was necessary, uh, it was that uh, this kind of brutality was necessary to get to the point where people had the right to make promises. But one, because they will remember that they have to pay their debt. But I want to emphasize that once we get to that point, once we have sovereign individuals who are responsible and self-disciplined, um, this idea of inflicting cruel pain on others really no longer serves a purpose. Um, so this really is something that can outlive its usefulness as individual, as societies mature, as societies become um, stronger and individuals become responsible. So, is this just like a statistic assumption now? Really so, so look, I, I, I want to be careful here. It's not Nietzsche being sadistic. It's Nietzsche attributing a certain kind of sadism to people. Well, isn't that just making an assumption about human nature? It's, it's Nietzsche's, like, people He's claiming this is the way people often take pleasure. That's the sadistic not celebrating it. And in fact, as we'll see in a moment, he thinks that uh, in many cases, it, this tendency outlives its usefulness. Right? So, I mean, you might say a similar thing about, I say exactly the same thing, about the process of burning into our memories the necessity of responsibility. So, yeah, I mean, brutal and harsh and cruel, he agrees with that. And once it's, as it were, done its work, it can be dropped, partially. And exa sorry, and exactly the same thing here. Uh, as we'll see just in a minute, he thinks it's, listen, he thinks it's a mark of a strong, powerful, mature society that it doesn't rely on this. That societies move beyond this and don't allow this channeling of cruelty in this way. Okay. Um, so based on this free moral system, the only thing that generates an obligation for that is severe punishment by the other person? No. no. Um, so what what we are working toward here is a sovereign individual, and that's still pre-moral. Um, so this is an account here. So, sorry. We still don't have ideas of guilt. We still don't have ideas of free will. We still don't have a moralized system yet. This is not yet morality. Uh, initially, it's something like the process that is necessary to create sovereign individuals, which, again, is not yet moralized. So we still have a ways to go before we get to morality. OK, so again, this is like just a, a psychological fact about the human animal. Um, Uh, I, I just said, although Nietzsche hasn't yet said, that moving society beyond this is an important uh, step in progress. Um, and I guess I want to say again that for Nietzsche, simply describing something like human nature is not the same thing as evaluating it. Um, 
maybe one way to think about it is that um, getting us to look clearly and honestly